I don't know about you, but uh, my kids told me that this this Christmas was boring. Yeah. It came and went. So I don't know about what your what your holiday was like, but my kids. It was a big letdown. So, you're not a kid anymore, you know. As you grow up, it's not like you can open up Sunday morning or not Sunday morning, whatever Christmas morning, you know, and 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 there's like bunches of gifts, and you're like all googly eyed and everything. And they're 18 years old now. There are some people that are talented. They're, they are gifted to be able for Christmas to be every morning for them. Amen. A little drummer boy. <laughs> <laughs> there are just some people that are like, every morning is like Christmas, like my dog. <laughs> every morning he sees me. It's like he's never seen me before. And he's missed me for so long. And I am so wonderful. Yeah, his brain about this baby. He's like, where have you been? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting. <laughs> uh, I told you about the uh, the bumper sticker I've seen. It says uh, "Bark less, wag more." Yeah. Yeah. I like that. You guys are the only ones over there. Hmm. Is that the Wait, Brazilian we'll side of the, the, yeah. the church? Of that? <laughs> <laughs> <In> South American. <laughs> Did you have you're the green eggs? <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna populate the entire side. <laughs> Bring them all in a couple. You. You fill that side, we'll fill that side. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, challenge. Pastor, did you have the green eggs? Uh, green eggs. Green eggs? <laughs> or the ham. I didn't have yeah. it this year because no? we were traveling. Uh, we did cereal. We uh, didn't have it. It's a special morning. Mm. There's green cereal out there. Yep, there probably is. Well, um, you know, we were finishing, um, or not finishing, continuing in, in Ephesians. And uh, I said we'd take a couple weeks off, but actually I was mistaken. We only took one week off. So uh, I hope you've been enjoying Philippians. I listen to it on the on um, on my uh, iPhone, and it goes from one book to the next, so I move through books. But we are in Ephesians, and if you'll uh, join us in the second chapter, we've got a lot of different stuff to say today. For one thing, I know that um, that not everybody watches the same television shows, but I maybe you still heard of some things. Um, one of these is called I think it's The Amazing Race, something like that. Anyone heard of it? Yeah. Heard of it. You ever watch it? No. no. Uh, apparently, it, it was it was surprising to me because what was so amazing is that it's in its 25th episode, uh -huh. um, which makes it, I think. Uh, you mean year? No, it's it's in its 14th year. It's actually it started in 2001, yeah. and it's renewed again for 2016. Not that I'm pumping the show or anything, but I do think it's amazing that you can make a television show about basically a treasure hunt. Yeah. It's basically about a treasure hunt, and everybody goes around, you know, collecting clues and so forth. But um, I want you to think about that as we get into uh, Ephesians together, and think about what the great race has to do with that. First of all, let me recap a little bit. In verse 3, if we can go there in chapter 2, and I'm grateful to God by His Holy Spirit to guide and direct us during our time of fellowship around His Word. And that the living breath and the living the manna of God uh, abide with us here that we might really enjoy and receive from God himself this morning through his word. How many agree and said amen? Amen. amen? amen. We are we are gathered together enjoying the breaking of God's bread, the word of life together, and it brings life to us. If we look at the second chapter, um, we're going to go uh, start at verse 3. To recap just a little bit. It says, Among whom we were all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as others. So when I talked about the great race, they go around, and if you've ever been in a in a, uh, a, a treasure hunt, you know what's really funny? Is that you heightened your pace, haven't you? Yes. Suddenly you're looking for something and you're doing it at a frenzied pace. Yes. And you don't even really know what you're looking for. A lot of times you're just trying to get there before someone else. Yeah. That's the, the, the goal, is just to beat someone else to this thing. Even if you don't even know what the thing is that you're looking for, everyone's at a frenzied pace just trying to get to it before everyone else gets it before them. Yes. Right. Now you'll understand what verse 3, 
um, we're going to begin talking about as we go through these other verses. In that, in this treasure hunt, if you will, we're trying to fulfill the desires and lusts of our flesh, the things that we want. We're all trying to do it together at frenzied pace, trying to get there before everyone else gets there and gets what we want. That's what life without Christ is. It's a frenzied yes. pace to try and fill this area of our life that can't be filled with natural, worldly things, but we're all trying to do it as fast as we can to meet yes. someone else before they get what we think we need to have. Yes, amen. Yep. Amen? Yes. Amen. And this is, this is what he says in verse 3. Right. He says, Among whom you were all once conducted yourself, the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of your flesh and the desires of the mind. In other words, everything that you think you want, everything you think you have to have, everything that you think will actually make you a happy person, you're going around in life trying to fill this, this unfillable void that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But before I get too far into that, let's go over to verses uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7 and go through a little recap together. We talked about in verse 4, but God, never had everybody say, but God. But God. It's like an interruption in the cycle that is taking place where it's, uh, it, but God. He intervened, but God, in verse 4, but God was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. We talked about his motive behind what he does. He's always motivated by what? Love. love because he is love. love, not just has, love. but he is love. So yes. everything he does is, cannot be Amen. motivated by anything else. If you can understand that, that's awesome. Because Amen. then your, your thoughts about, you know, does God make people do things? Does he make people sick? Does he make people... You have to ask yourself, what would love do? You know? Yes. And you love your kids, and you're just a second level love. <laughs> you know, you're you're just you're just a wannabe lover. Yes. You know? You don't have what it takes to love. You think you do, and you try to do the best you can, but you, you just let's just be honest with ourselves. We don't have what it takes to love. Amen. Because God is love. Yes. And the only way we can love is if we obey and do as God loves, yes. and do as He directs. Amen. Otherwise, we turn that love into a self a self fulfillment. Yes, amen. And then we we end up warping it. Yes. All right. So God's uh, verse four tells us, of course, His great love is always the motivation behind what He's doing because that's who He is. I like to uh, look and when I think of verses. Four and five, I think about not marveling at his mercy, but marveling rather at the giver of that mercy. Don't ever look at just the stand in awe of his grace or his mercy. Mm -hmm. Stand in awe of him. Amen. Because the grace and the mercy are just the gift. Mm -hmm. You gotta stand in awe of the giver. Yeah. Amen. Not just Amen. the gift. Yes. Yes. Say that's a wonderful gift. But the giver's so much greater. Yes. You know, Amen. And all this is to show you the giver, not to stand in awe of the gift. All right, in verse uh, 6, see, I didn't read verse 5, so we'll do it. Even while we were in, our, in trespasses and sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So again, this is, nothing what, this is nothing we could do for ourselves. That is what the idea, the whole idea behind while we were dead, while we, while we were, i.e., unable to do for ourselves, God made us alive in Christ. How many know when you're dead, you can't do nothing for yourself? Amen. Yeah. yeah. That's the whole idea. You, yes. While we were dead in trespasses, and we could not do anything for ourselves, yes. Christ died for us. Yes. Amen. So what he's done for us, what we couldn't do for ourselves. You need to hold on to that. He's done yes. for us. Everybody say that. He's done for us. He's, he's done, done for us. What we couldn't do for ourselves. What we can't do for ourselves. He's done for me. Me. What I can't do for myself. The reason that's important is because the rest of this, we're taking it little by little, but the rest of this is a completion of one of those thoughts. Yes. Even while we were yet sinners, while we were dead in trespasses and sin, Christ died for us. It's important to understand what we can't do for ourselves. Bless you. What we can't do for ourselves, Christ has done for us. And as we keep that thought in mind, we'll see how Paul helps to round out some of those thoughts through this, art, this group of, of encouragements and arguments, if you will, uh, that he gives to us. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for uh, because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. We, called, we talked about uh, 
uh, sons of disobedience, as in the disobedient one, the original person who disobeyed God, and then that same uh, disobedience was passed on to each and every person through a son of Adam, a daughter of all right, um, verse, wait, did I read the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. I must have been in the wrong chapter. Sorry. We did talk about that the week before. That's why it was so fresh in my mind. All right, help me out here. Verse 6, yeah, raised six, us up. Six. Six. Raised us up and seated us together <coughs> and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So that was, we talked about that being the ultimate place <coughs> of favor. Didn't we? Yes. See, a lot of these things are kind of nutshells of things that we've covered already. Where is it to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places? Is to be in the ultimate place of favor. Not just yes. in the universe, but in the sight of God. Yes. To be in the ultimate place of favor. So that's what being at the right hand of God the Father. Sometimes we think about it. I, I talked about it a few weeks ago. We think about it, you know, like a little throne for Jesus and a little throne. We don't really know if that's really for the Holy Spirit, but we assume, you know, there's a little throne to each side, one for the Holy Spirit, one for Jesus, you know, a big throne in the middle. And it's really not that way. It's, you know, there's equality among them. There aren't big, you know, big little inside, left, right. It's It means with, with uh, uh, equality among them. You know, at his right hand is to to be at the ultimate place of favor, and that, that translates to us being in that place in Christ Jesus, the ultimate place of favor Amen. in God. How many of you know that that's, that's hard to comprehend, but that's who we are in Christ yes. Jesus. Yes. Amen. We share the ultimate place of God's favor. All right, um, let's see, verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. We talked about marveling at the giver, not the gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Alright, I don't want to cover that until we get into some of the other verses together, because uh, they all flow together. So, I'm going to continue to read if you will. Because he continues to talk in verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are the workmanship, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made by the flesh, made in the flesh by hands. Okay, so now, now we start hearing out what he's talking about, the difference between uh, grace and works. Remember he talked about that in the verses up above, but we always, we always, you know, by grace you are saved through faith and that not of works. So he's starting a compelling argument about what grace is and compares it to works. In that, he also starts to bring up the circumcision and the uncircumcision, because that's where we get into the works and the grace difference between works and grace. So, let's see if he, uh, as, as he starts talking about this, how we can better illustrate it. Alright. In verse 12, he says, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, for whatever reason, I really felt compelled to share on this um, particular topic of hope. And the idea of being without hope and without God. You know, if you put that together, you have to say to yourself, there is no hope except in God. There, there is no hope except in God. You know, it's, it's a hopeless existence. Now, when I started out talking about the great race, um, if we all looked at ourselves the way we were, we were trying to fill a, a void in our life, but all we had to work with was everything we saw, felt, touched, and knew. We were all trying to fill this void in our lives, going around like the great race. 
just trying to beat everybody to it, but we didn't know what, what it was we were looking for. Yes. I don't know about you, but does that yes. resonate with you? You yes. were like, yes. I'll try more relationships. <clears throat> yes. I'll try more sex. I'll try more drugs. I'll try making more money. Yes. I'll try having more friends. I'll yes. try having no friends. <laughs> I mean, you just go on, on and on yes. and on and on. And believe it or not, a lifespan is not even long enough to exhaust all the possibilities yes. Amen. Yes. of trying to suppress my truest need by filling this void in my life. Yes. Amen. You've seen people say square peg and round hole. You know, we try this constantly. If you ever watch a kid, do you want? You got this run, do You watch a kid, yes. and there, there's like this this one game. I think we got it here at church. And he, he basically has a triangle, a square, a star shape, a circle, and then it has a little board or ball or something. And then you try to put all these shapes in the right hole in hopes that eventually you're able to get the right hole, the right shape, and everything fit. Well, life is like that. We go around with a single circular hole that God alone can fulfill. Yes. And we try to stuff entertainment into the hole and find out that, that frustrated me, that doesn't work. Yes. Then we'll try somebody else. Yes. Whether it's a family member, whether it's a child, you know, I'll have a child, that'll make my marriage, that'll make my life, that'll give me purpose. Okay? Try to fit that in that round hole. But it too is a different shape. It's a square or it's a triangle. But it won't fit in that hole. And then we try other things. And we try all these things. We spend our lives trying to stick something in that hole. Mm -hmm. well, I can seem to stop it. <laughs> That's why it says, without God and without hope. Because there is no hope without God. Amen. Amen. And we kind of scratch the surface on understanding that now. But how that translates to the world around us to see the hopelessness and the, the futility, the vanity of the world around us trying to fill that void. Because we were created with one purpose. One purpose. Yes. Not gonna, I'm not going to ask the guests because then if you guess, it would be a good guess, but if it's not the same, everybody feels like, uh, I heard the guess wrong. So, I'm just going to say, you were, you were created with one purpose in mind, and that's fellowship with God. Man. created with one purpose in mind and nothing else has any hope of filling that purpose in our lives Man. except God Man. so you can try to stuff everything in it and spend your entire life shoving people shoving relationships shoving fame, shoving fortune shoving everything in there but it's still around Whole that only God can fill. Fellowship with Him is what we were created for. Yes. Plain and simple. There's lots of other more lofty ideas, but the way I see it, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. He's the only one great enough to want share himself with someone else and know they would be better for it. Yes. Amen. <laughs> yes. Anybody who thinks that way on planet Earth is probably a little twisted. Yes. Amen. Yes. But he's the only one that could say the best thing for them is me. Yes. Amen. 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 In other words, Amen. I got nothing to gain from this. <coughs> yes. The best thing for them is me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Paul gave us a little bit of that feeling when he said, you know, I'd like to be able to go home and be with the Lord. And then you almost feel that sinking feeling. Ah, yeah. But it's more needful than I stay with you. <laughs> you know? Yes. You almost Amen. get that feeling that he understood that the needs of the others. Yes. Not for himself. He was placing the needs of others yes. above Amen. his own. And really only God can do that. Yes. We we try, we do a little bit, but really only God can say the best thing for someone else is me. Amen. I can never say Amen. that. 
So a whole lifetime sometimes is not enough for a person to exhaust the ways of thinking. I can, you know, as people can say, well, well, just knowledge. Knowledge will, will, will fulfill this need. So they spend their lifetime gathering knowledge and, and of the universe or of their own spirituality and all the, there are so many things. You know, we think we think only about the superficial things, but there are so many other things that people substitute for God and try to shove in that hole and can spend their entire lifetime. And that's part of the way the enemy has it, is he would like for us to spend our lifetime trying to stuff something in that hole, anything but God. And that's why there's resistance and pushback. If there's anything but God is what the world tells us. Anything but God, fill that void. All right. Mm -hmm. We are created for fellowship with God. That's as plain and simple need that we have because that's what we were created with. You can deny it. You can say you came from apes. You can say you came from monkeys. You can say you came from, from fish. You can say you came from an amoeba. But the ultimate thing is you were created for fellowship with God and nothing else will do. Amen. Amen? Amen. Nothing else will do. Adam and Eve taught us one thing in the garden, and that was everything we need is in God. And not everything we want is what we need. Everything we need is in God. Remember we talked a few weeks ago, everything that they needed in the garden was there. But what they wanted, they thought they needed. That's what the enemy is always on tactic to try and get us to expand beyond the horizons of what we need into what we want, telling us what we want is actually what we need. But everything we need is in God. So if we never really take the time to, to train ourselves not to be, uh, not to spend our lifetime trying to fulfill, fulfill our wants and recognize that my needs are met in God, then we will sometimes end up spending the rest of our life trying to fulfill the wants. And if we didn't learn anything from the garden, it should have been. Not everything I want, I need. Amen? Amen. Amen. In the garden, if they said, well, I want the, the to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's, that's understandable. But as believers, we now know not everything we want, we need. So we train ourselves not to be subject to our wants and to recognize that my needs are all in God. They're, they're, they're there. I just haven't seen it yet, or I need to see from Him how that need can be met in my life. So as maturing believers, I would encourage you, look at your wants, look at your needs. Amen. And not everything you want is a need. Amen. Amen. All right. Here, Paul starts talking about enmity. Um, has anyone ever let somebody borrow some money? Yes. Of course you have. <laughs> it's, it's, yes. It happens to everybody. Yes. Yeah. It was 50 cents when when I was a kid. My my school sold donuts, Krispy Kreme donuts, and in the morning. A kid who skips breakfast because he's got so many really important things to do. He gets to school and he's hungry, right? Then you can see kind of like uh, what Esau who sold his, his birthright for a bowl of soup. Well, you can see how things can get out of control with a little hunger. And I remember that people were always trying to hit other people up for a quarter. <laughs> Hey, can I borrow a quarter? 
Why? I want to go buy a donut. Always somebody want to go buy a donut for the quarter. So when I was a kid, if I didn't learn anything, it was people always would hit you up for a month. I don't think I ever saw a single one of those quarters I let go come back to me. So if you're remembering like me, I'm sure that you borrow, you let somebody borrow some money come back. somewhere. And then they come back later. And they're like, can I borrow a quarter? You're like, I already let you borrow a quarter, and I still haven't got my quarter back. So I'm not going to be doing that again because we still haven't reconciled from the last quarter you owed. Anybody understand where we're coming from now? Yes. You can't really feel confident letting somebody borrow something again if they've never paid you back for the last thing they borrowed. Yes. Right? Right. Now, that's what I'm going to look at as what we can we can consider enmity. There's, there's adversarial tension because I let you borrow something, some money. You never paid me back. But now you want more, and I'm not going to give it to you. <laughs> because I didn't get back what you already owed. All right. Now, enter into this God and Jesus Christ. Here you can see a little bit of that feeling that you get when you know that somebody has borrowed $100 from you, $1,000 from you, $5,000, $10,000, okay. or just $10. It doesn't really matter the figure. You know that gut feeling that you get when they come back to you again and say, can I borrow some money? Yep. Say, sure, after you pay me back what you owe me. Yep. Now we all understand this idea of debt. And in verse 14, I mean, let's go over there together. There's an introduction of what's called enmity. <coughs> Maybe it was in the verses before, let's see. Well, we talked about, let me recap a little. We talked about in verse 12, without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers, no hope, and without God in the world. We talked about that. In verse 13, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off were brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay. I will continue reading. Verse 14, for he himself is our <coughs> peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances so that, I'm sorry, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. All right, now... I hope that didn't get you a little confused. What we're talking about here is that what separated Jew and Gentile? In essence, what separated Jew and Gentile? Well, the law. Yes, a covenant. But in most recent time, the law. They were given commandments. Gentiles were not. Now, if we go all the way back to the garden, we know there were no Jew, there was no Gentile. So, what he's talking about here is that the thing that separated Jews from Gentiles was that Jews adhered to and kept, for the most part, the law. That was that was their their modus apparatus. Is that what it is? There you go. That's that's their MO. <laughs> they they keep the law. And that's what lets me look down my nose at everyone else. I keep the law and you don't. Okay? That's what separated Jew from Gentile. And so Paul starts saying, you know what? You guys, you Gentiles. You were aliens from this. You know? You were without hope and without God. Right? But he says, interestingly enough, he says the thing that separated Jews and Gentiles, the law, Jesus abolished it. Yes. Let's look at what he said here. In 
in verse uh, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law and commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man. All right, so if you remember we from, Bert, from chapter 1, we talked about he's bringing together all things in heaven and in earth, bringing all things together, yea, even in Christ. That the whole idea was to bring everything together in Christ for this purpose that he's sharing with us now. First of all, he wants us to know, Paul wants us to know that the thing that separated Jew and Gentile has been removed. So that there, in essence, is no longer a difference between Jew and Gentile. Yeah. But that's not really good enough. Because what he also says is that the thing that separated Jew and Gentile is also the thing that separated God and man. So he says, not only did I take out what separated Jew and Gentile so that both are the, now the same before me, but he said, I've also removed the thing that was between God and man. So that now, that law and all the ordinances and everything that was contained in it no longer stands between God and man. All right, you say, well, what does that have to do with the story about the donuts and 25 cents? Because you see, when somebody owes you something, there's really nothing more that you can do until they pay back your debt. Yep. Their debt. There's 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 nothing more you can do for them. Unfortunately, there's a song that says, We owed a debt we could not pay. Yes. Amen. See, we owed a debt we could not pay. Now, here's an interesting thing. It's uh let me see how I worded it here. I'd like to kind of put it in the same way. Because this, this idea of having debt is really pretty solid when you look at the whole thing that, that's being said here. Now, let me ask this first. Anybody have a credit card? Yeah. Have you ever had a credit card? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you ever had a credit card, you realize that uh, they have the monthly minimum. And that's the little tiny bit that you pay just to keep the account open and keep you from from being, I guess, foreclosed, if you will. Yep. Well, it never really is enough to get the bill paid if you continue to spend on the car. Mm -hmm. yep. And here's the thing. Most people continue to spend on the car <laughs> and, pay the and pay the minimum. Not just pay the minimum and stop spending. They continue to spend and pay the minimum so they never can get ahead. Okay. So can I can I give you some ideas about this debt? And God's not like trying to hold our trespasses against us. But what he is saying is that this is an unavoidable fact. You owe a debt. Hmm. Yes. Because man sinned, we owed a debt. A debt that we couldn't pay. And because we sinned, we just kept sinning. Which means it was like a credit card mm -hmm. that we paid the minimum on, but we kept spending. You say, how do we pay the minimum? Well, interestingly enough, in comes the law. Well, it tells me, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But it does also give me some things to do if I should do. If I did something, then I could offer up this to cover over that. It's like paying the minimum. <laughs> on your credit card balance. Mm -hmm. You can offer up a little something to kind of keep the pressure off, <laughs> but it's never going to pay the debt. And so no matter how many lambs you slay, no matter how many bulls you slay, no matter how many doves you slay, no matter how many anything you slay, you're just paying the minimum. You're just keeping the, the account open and in good standing, as it were, but you are not going to be able to pay off the debt because you just keep spending. Amen. Amen. We just keep sinning. We just yes. keep spending. Yes. Amen. So we can cover it, and we can cover it, 
And we can cover it, we can keep paying the minimum, but the debt just keeps going up. We all know that. What are we at? 18 trillion dollars as a nation? Yeah. Something like that? Somebody help me out. 18? 18, 18, 18 trillion. Why? Because we just keep spending and paying the minimum. Right? Yep, the answer is spend. So here's the question that's asked throughout the scriptures, and we should be asking ourselves then. This almost makes it sound like the law was bad. It almost makes it sound like, like this, this end of ours was the law. What? I thought the law was good. So how could the law be my end? Well, it is good. The law is good. But the idea is, even though it was good, it was bad for me. Because what ended up happening was, it just pointed out my failures and flaws. Yes. It made me accountable now, which is another one of those financial terms. It made me accountable. Now suddenly, there's a standard by which I'm responsible and to which I'm responsible. Now if there was no law, then I wouldn't be responsible to a standard of keeping it. So the law is good, but it's bad for me. Yes. Because that standard now suddenly come, becomes the, the means whereby I'm judged or held accountable. When you look at the law and you say, it's kind of like God saying, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and sticking his big finger and saying, these are all the things I don't want you to do. When in reality, it's God pointing us to somebody else. It's a law that brings some hope in the sense that it says, the man that fulfills all this shall live. It brings some hope. But really, it points us to the only person who can truly fulfill the law. Because Jesus didn't say, I come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Amen. Right? Amen. So the law, that debt, has now been compiling for years. Yes. and centuries. And although God wants to help us and wants to do something, that debt stands between us and Him. Yes. A debt that He can't allow to go unpaid. Yes, amen. And then the law, it only makes the minimum payments for that. Keeps covering it, but never deals with it. And everything that He said in the law gave us hope that if we did it, we could be right with God. Yes. But unfortunately, we couldn't do it. Yes. Amen. So that sounds bad. <laughs> yes. But really, if you look at all this, all that every thou shalt not and every law that was given and every ordinance that was associated with it was all really God pointing, not at us, but at Jesus Christ. Yes. And saying, there is hope for you. Yes. You can you can be right with me if yes. you do this, 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 that, 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 this, and that. Yes. You do that, you can be right with me. Amen. So it gave us all hope. Yes. But then the realization that we couldn't achieve that brought that to us. Yes. Yes. But that pointing was still pointing at Jesus Christ so that the true fulfillment of every law and stipulation they're about could truly be accomplished. Amen. Let's look at, uh, continue reading here. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's see. All right. Verse 14, we'll read it again. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one. Okay, so stop there for a minute. How did he make both one? Again, he's taking the law out of the equation. 
There's no longer a difference between Jew and Gentile, between you, Mr. Jew, and me, Mr. Gentile. There's no difference between us any longer because Amen. he's now withdrawn that. The only thing that gave you the idea that you were different from me and me the idea that I was different from you was the law, and that no longer is an issue. Amen. So with that, with that gone, he says, I've now made peace with you two. There's no longer two people. We talked a couple weeks about the only people, there are two people in the earth. The only two people there are are born again and not. And there is no longer a Jew, a Gentile, bond or free, Amen. male or female. Either. Amen. The only two people that God recognizes are new birth, new creature, and, and not. Yes. So he says, I've taken out the issue of the law, making peace between you two. Which wasn't God's ultimate plan. The ultimate plan is to level the playing field so that everybody recognizes that they need peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. So the same law that brought condemnation and judgment to me was also the same law that brought condemnation and judgment to the Jew. They just thought they were better at it than I was. Yes. They were closer. They were closer to doing what the law said <laughs> than I was. Yeah. But in the end, it wasn't a, a, a game of horseshoes and hand grenades. Amen. You, you can't just be close. Amen. 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 So, <laughs> four atomic weapons. So, then he says, this law was the same thing that divided Jew, Jews and Gentiles. It's also the same thing that divided man from God. Yes. Amen. So, what he's going to do now is he's going to make of the two one yes. in Christ Jesus. Now, what's interesting is that the law was the standard the high standard of godliness in the earth. Now, only the person who could exceed that standard could become the new standard by which all else was judged. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So Jesus fulfilling the law meant that he could now become the standard by which everything and everyone else is judged. which would be terrible if it wasn't for the fact that we have become in Christ. So there is now no condemnation to those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, but who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. See, being in Christ, this one new man, being in Christ means that not only has the standard been raised, but I am now in Christ who is the standard. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you seeing how God's done this? Yes. Amen. He said, okay, I'm going to take out by giving, by, by, by giving all these rules and laws, I'm going to basically point you to the fact that you need somebody else to do this for you. Amen. And then I'm going to provide the person who will do this for you. And then I'm going to cause him to be the representative of everyone who's done wrong and everyone who's done right. So that in him I can condemn all and, and, and get rid of all of the, the wrong and give us all the right. In other words, that debt, Jesus became responsible for all the debt. And he wiped it away and ripped up the, the writing and all of the deeds and all of the things that were associated with that debt. So that I, in him, could stand before God right. Amen. I have peace with God Amen. through Jesus. 
it was cool that I was at peace with Jews. I didn't know I was really in balance. Mm -hmm. But what was great is that even though I was reconciled to my Jewish partners, the real truth was both of us were still needy. And that because of Jesus having fulfilled the law, he's now given us a position at the right hand of God the Father, the ultimate place of authority, of, of favor. He's given that to us by grace, through faith, and that not of works, as then he mentioned us. You understand his arguments now? Yeah. Amen. He says, this was never, the gospel's never about Jew or Gentile. It's about the grace of God. Let's finish up the chapter real quick. He abolished in his own flesh the enmity, that is, the law, and all of the commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God. Remember we talked about that? Jew and Gentile. Both now reconciled to God. They might have been closer because they had the law and worked at it a lot of years, but they never kept it. It didn't matter how far you didn't keep it by, just the idea you had to keep it or not. So all those points <coughs> came in, you know, those were all pointing to Jesus. And then uh, verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. The death, that, that gut feeling that I can't do for you even what I'd like to because your debt is still outstanding. Right? right? God doesn't look down at you and say, you owe me a quarter now. Amen. <laughs> Amen. No. He, he, that debt was Praise that God. debt was paid for now. So God doesn't have that sinking feeling that he'd like to help but can't. Praise God. Right? And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. So he's talking, obviously, the same peace that we talk about is available to Jew and Gentile alike. We were the farther off. They were a little nearer. But it doesn't matter because they, need, they needed the same good news of peace with God through Jesus Christ that we did. Amen? Amen. Actually, that's from Isaiah, I think uh, I've got it here in my notes, Isaiah 57, uh, 19, if you'd like to see it. And that's where Paul pulls that from to, uh, to bring to us this idea of reconciliation both for Jew and Gentile. Finishing up the chapter in verse 19, I'm sorry, 18. Through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Remember the highest revelation of God, the Father. Right? That's what it's all about now. Verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In other words, this good news, this revelation of, of, of all peace with God through Jesus Christ and all in one body, Jesus himself, came through the apostles and prophets, perpetuated first from the Lord Jesus Christ. That word added to by the apostles and prophets, as we saw here, Paul, give us the same, he's one of the prophets and apostles. Peter, one of the apostles and prophets. So they added to a message that Jesus first gave. Right? Yeah. And then uh, verse 21. In whom the whole building, being fitly, or I'm sorry, being fitted together, rose into a holy temple in the Lord. Cool. In whom also we are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So, thank God for being a holy habitation. Yes. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I hope that's encouraged you to uh, to understand more fully. I mean that that chapter gave to us a huge.